Hello? You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Hello, hello. Greetings. Hello. So yes, welcome to Getting Brands On Board. Uh, you guys are in for a wonderful treat. We have an amazing group of panelists, very diverse. Um, and we were just actually talking upstairs about, you know, who are we actually talking to out here? We know that a lot of you guys are content producers, so we really want to design this panel so you guys get a, a ton of information about a very complicated space. Um, so we can make it uh, informed. If you guys have questions, we can get a ton of questions in at the end. If you guys have a burning question, maybe we can have it during the session. Um, but more importantly, my name is Stephen Amato. I am the president and content officer for Omelets, an eight-year-old brand entertainment studio located here. Um, so I've been doing this a long time. We, our clients are range from HBO to Stars to NBC to Walmart, Microsoft, GM. Uh, yeah, sorry, clients, I forgot. But that's uh, so. I, I have a, I have a, a little bit of experience doing this, as do the people on the panel. Um, and I want to make some introductions um, to Justine. How is it you say your last name? Ezeric. Ezeric. Yes. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna attempt that. <laughs> just to be totally. Um, Justine, if you don't know uh, Justine, I, you probably haven't been on the internet. Um, but if you could maybe just explain uh, about, um, you know, she's basically a brand herself. So can you explain a little bit about who you are and what you're doing? Yeah, so my name is Justine, but online I go as I Justine, which did in fact come before iCarly, so don't let her kid you. <laughs> Thank you, Nickelodeon, for stealing my idea, but no big deal. Um, so basically, I create content for YouTube, uh, from sketch comedy to product reviews to video gameplay, where I play video games and talk over top of them. So it sounds weird, but people do watch it. Uh, in total, I have over about 300 million views across all of my videos. Yeah, so there's that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, moving on, we have EJ. EJ, you want to talk about a little bit about what you do in your company? Sure. Um, it's called EJD Productions. Um, we view ourselves, I think, secondarily as creatives, but first and foremost as uh, sales and marketers. And so we um, try and come up with solutions based on content that we've created, that we like, and then try and build in brands that make sense, uh, ideally telling the story of the brand in a very entertaining format. I feel like I'm getting some reverberation on this as well. <laughs> Can you guys hear us up here? No. no? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> volume check. We gotta lift it. Okay. Okay. Did right. everyone hear what I said, or should I repeat it? Okay. Um, so, uh, EJD Productions is the name of my company. Um, my business partner and I um, view ourselves probably secondarily as creatives, but first and foremost as sales and marketers. Um, we try and find interesting stories to tell about a brand that can entertain, but really try and find solutions for the brands um, first and foremost. All right, cool. And Jesse, um, director of brand entertainment at Generate, a very, very cool um, studio, I guess, um, management company. All things. Generate yeah. was founded about a little over six years ago as a multi-platform studio. We have, yes, a production company in-house, full production capabilities, and that's how we interface with brands, producing things that we both partner with, distribution partners, and MSN or Yahoo, and then producing things straight for places like MTV or for AMC. We also do have a management company, which is interesting and unique, so there's some interplay between our clients, everyone from directors, comedians, actors, and writers, and then we also have a, a production company. So a studio with a deal at CBSP. So it's, it's a weird hybrid, and to make matters even weirder slash more interesting, uh, in January, we were acquired by Alloy Digital. So that arm that we were missing of the company, the distribution arm, now has the Alloy family with it. So a powerhouse in the, in the young marketing teens, young men as well, and, and just growing and growing. So we are both agnostic. We work for Alloy Digital and produce for that platform, and then we also produce anywhere else. And uh, David uh, Adamson for, uh, works for an amazing company. You want to tell a little bit about UEG? If you don't know about it, you should. Sure. Uh, the company we work for is United Entertainment Group, and we're an entertainment marketing company. We're, we're retained by brands, and whether that's uh, consumer packaged good brands from Frito-Lay and Procter & Gamble to Samsung Mobile to any number of brands, and we try and develop, uh, along with their marketing departments and other agency partners, sort of holistic entertainment strategies that takes in the world of film, television, music, online content. So I guess for the purpose of this, 
I think I'm the only one who actually represents brands and helps them navigate the space. Yeah, so, all right, so that, let's talk a little bit about the space before we kind of go, I ask these guys to give a little bit more deep dive into what they do and maybe give one example, so we'll do that after, but I just want to give a little context about the space for those of you that aren't aware of uh, the brand and entertainment space and how disruptive 2012 is in marketing and uh, entertainment, uh, just as, you know, in terms of what's happening with GM at the upfronts. Uh, representing $3 billion, they're holding back and, you know, they want to produce their own shows. Um, you got, obviously, YouTube, the rollout means um, a world of difference when things start to go over the top. Uh, you know, that, that's a major game change here. Uh, Microsoft today doing away with uh, the, the do not track uh, on their new IE10 browser. I know it sounds like a weird thing to bring up for this, but it is totally relevant to what we do. Um, it's just, right now is a real, it's a, it's a crazy time. 63% of the world's largest brands say that they're going to participate, or already are, in 2012 in brand and entertainment. That's a lot of growth. Um, so it, what it means is a lot of opportunity for people that make content, because there's some simple truths, regardless of how the deals get structured. You know, th just, here's five different ways deals get structured with brands. Um, it, it, the one thing that's consistent is that brands need to reach consumers and people need to be entertained. So content producers, believe it or not, uh, are in a really, really nice position if they could just kind of define who they are, what they want to do, and really, you know, go after, uh, you know, a kind of a true north. So that's what we're here to do is basically give you some insights, give you some intel on how to maybe think about um, the future uh, in this crazy and ever-changing world. Uh, and with that, um, what better way to, to do that is to literally just kind of open it up to these guys and saying, it is a crazy, ever-changing, diverse world. We've got five different approaches uh, here. Why don't we start with somebody that actually is sitting, has done an amazing job as a content producer. I mean, what would you call yourself, Justine? What, is it, are you a... What is it? Is it a web celebrity? I mean, I know I don't. It's a horrible yeah, phrase. We, we don't really like that. <laughs> I mean, mostly it is a content creator because I'm creating content. And the other thing we're talking about too, when we're up in the, the room, is it is distribution as well. So a lot of times, you know, I'll be hired specifically just for talent to be in a video or to be in a commercial. But then they will also hire me as distribution, where I will actually release this video onto my network, onto YouTube. So it's kind of like two different things, but I mean, mostly it is a content creator. I did, I do have a clip of just a few, just an example, I if you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. I think <laughs> so that'd be really help helpful. Let's, let's roll uh, the I just. Oh, hands. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I've never actually made a pop chip sandwich before, so... Oh, no, this looks me, great. Let me know how that is. Yeah, this looks great. I just want to make sure it, it's on there nice. I wash my hands. <clears throat> Xbox! Bang! Hi! Alright, I'm just gonna keep this short. I just need your half of the rent check. Oh, Barbie. This is the life. The sun, the sand, all of these cute boys to look at. Now give me my number, because you're obviously flirting with me! <laughs> Kiss old technology goodbye. Join iJustine and the All Access team for the world's biggest technology event, CES. So that's I, Justine, and she's an interesting, uh, you know, you're in a really interesting position because you are the content producer, you're, you are the brand, and basically brands are coming to you and basically investing in your everything. Like, the, the, you hit their demographic, certain brands that want to reach uh, a certain audience, she is creating the content, but she's also delivering an audience, which is really, really important for people that out there that aspire to have a platform uh, really go and look at what, what I, Justine is doing because she's cr created an entire platform. She's basically become a network. So other than the Spike commercial, which obviously was super overproduced, but that was something where I covered CES with Spike, but they also had me post that video on my channel to help let all of my audience know that, hey, I'm going to be at CES, tune into TV and watch me hosting the show. But the rest of those videos I've actually created myself with a tripod, put my camera up there, just making sure I've got the shots, and then I edited them all. So, you know, you don't have to have all of this crazy technology to be able to do that. Just, you know, camera, computer, and an idea. 
Yeah, it doesn't always have to make sense. I mean, we get crazy <laughs> requests from clients that have a lot of money to do stuff for 10K. And it's the companies that are doing that are the, that are the companies that are getting the, the much bigger assignments. So you, you, wanna, you wanna think about paying it forward in this space a lot. Um, so Jesse, I wanna do girls first there, or ladies first. Um, sure. So your, what's your background? I don't, I... Yeah, um, it's interesting because my background is actually brand side. So a couple years ago, Johnson & Johnson started what's called an activation team, which is essentially people, and my background background, college background, is in production. So they wanted to have production-minded people in-house so that when they were considering buying or actually buying properties like we all now produce, they had someone of the mind to figure out what is this integration going to look like, how is it going to come to life, which in my opinion was incredibly smart. So I spent almost three years there with them understanding why they buy what they buy. And as a producer, I always kind of aspired, this was in New York, I'm now in LA, to move to the LA side. But that background, being in-house at the brand for the day they make that decision to stay, we're going to invest in this production or we're not has been invaluable. It kind of helps me guide us. We can be crazy creative and that's always fantastic, but sometimes you have to really think like a brand and pare back a little bit or be creative, but in the right way. So that is a really interesting background um, in this space and certainly valuable for Generate. Do you guys, at Generate, do you guys, since you're now sitting on an alloy platform, mm -hmm. do you um, find yourselves responding to RFPs? Can you can you give these guys a little? If you don't know, and I, if you do, I apologize. But it, it might be really nice to know what an RFP is if you don't know. Can you explain? Maybe sure, what that is, because sure. I didn't know when, when I got into this, this sure. business. Sure. So literally an RFP is a request for proposal, and it comes from usually an agency, whether it's a media agency or a creative agency, someone working on behalf of a brand, literally to spend that brand's money to make marketing happen to sell product. And it includes information about what their goals are marketing-wise, usually when it comes to me, and I'm sure my colleagues um, here, looking for content, looking for a content play. We then sit around in a room and come up with ideas and figure out how to respond to this RFP and how to pitch them something that they're going to want to buy. Um, but at the same time, at Generate, we both respond to tons of RFPs. And if we really believe in something, we take it out. So we become salespeople without even responding to something and say, we believe in this. We think you should buy it. We're a little bit aware, hopefully more than a little bit, of your marketing goals this year. And we really believe in this. And sometimes those ideas that we take out come from people that we've met in the marketplace like you guys or like Justine. So we hear a great idea, we take in a pitch, we find a way to partner, and then we take it out. So I'm sure we can discuss that a little bit more, but just an interesting relationship to be built. Did you hear that? Uh, so <laughs> that, that's very valuable to hear. Um, these guys are open for business. Uh, they're, they're sitting on a platform um, that are basically having brands asking them to create content. And they're always looking for amazing content producers. So, sorry, you're gonna get bombarded. That's okay. <laughs> to follow up on that, yeah. um, if this makes sense, it, for me, at least my process and my advice would be, the, the creative always has to be the first step and it drives everything. However, it then becomes secondary after you've got that idea. Then you try and find who you can provide solutions for after that. So it starts with creative, but then you have to switch hats and start thinking about that from a business solution standpoint. Yeah, that's, that's clearly the, the opposite of how we do things at Omelette, but you know, that's why we're having a panel to talk about this stuff. We, we generally, we have two sides of our business. Half of our business is work, you know, basically work retainers solving brands problems using content. The other half of our business is a studio where we, we, we do that, where we kind of invest in our own IP and then go out and take it to market, always with the idea that we can fund it with, because we have so much background in doing these branded deals, we have these kind of hooks um, that we can package brands into. But you know, we make a, a, the pr predominantly most of our money in starting with a strategic problem from a brand mm -hmm. and solving it using amazing entertainment. So the idea, in this space, solving a problem is, to, in, our, in our world, uh, really the, our approach. So, sure. as you can see, everyone's got a different uh, opinion. Um, David, I'd love to know your opinion on this. This is I a mean, good my topic. My opinion is completely aligned with that because we don't actually represent any properties. We don't create any content unless we're asked to do so. We have to pitch ideas. We have to represent the brand. 
we have to be accountable to the brand directors and the CMOs and really make sure whatever content we're discussing is completely on message because we're looking at a universe of millions of pieces of content and we really only have one, one problem to solve, right. which is communicate with these consumers in an effective way that creates love for the brand. And do you guys, um, speaking of that, do you guys, are you, are you measuring love? Is there a love meter? <laughs> you know right. what? I, I would imagine there would be. That's a really interesting space. I mean, I think defining what success looks like, yeah. and we took, it goes back to the RFP. There are great RFPs, and there are horrible RFPs. And the first thing whenever, we write more than we read when it comes to RFPs, is what does success look like? Right. And what's the path to success? And then, then how do we engage creative, smart people to solve that problem with us? But without knowing what success looks like, and it's different in so many cases. Amen. Uh, yeah, so if you guys are, I mean, it's, for us, a lot of it is about finding kind of how do we create content that solves a problem. Um, so that, I think it's just a shift as opposed to when I was, a, I was a playwright in New York City for 10 years, and I didn't give a shit about brands. I was like, what, what is solving a problem for me? What's the, my voice, and what do I need to get out of me? Man, that's changed. Uh, I still do that. But when, I, when we're talking about brand and entertainment, there is, a, there is a huge business infrastructure behind this. There's a reason why brands are investing in content. And it's, you know, it is to make them love the brand or to sell more products. So we always, I mean, in this space, we always have to think about that as producers. You have to think about the, the kind of the overarching business. But I think that's, uh, sorry, just to step in, I think that's, that's true out of this brand and content space as well because we have these same conversations with the heads of film studios and TV networks all the time. They believe their show X is perfect for brand Y, but they're looking at it from a consumer's point of view. They don't know what the brand's objective is two years, five years, ten years from now, or even six months from now. They're, they're trying to cobble it together and they sometimes come to us with what they think is a solution for a problem that we don't have. So it scales down from the biggest providers to the smallest. So EJ, you have a different approach. Can you, guys, can you give us a little, like maybe a, an insight or an example of how this approach is working for you? And because, and, you know, it's completely, it, it works. He's here doing great work with huge brands. So we want, I'm sure these guys would love to hear how we do creative first and then get brands on board. Sure, yeah, I think um, it's important to make the distinction. When I worked on the agency side at a couple of large ad agencies, I wore the hat that you were talking about earlier where you have a specific objective in mind and you start from there. Most of us, I think, sitting in this audience today are starting from the opposite end. You're trying to solve a solution, but you're first and foremost thinking about your creative process. So for us, um, with Fashion Star, I'm not sure if uh, anyone's seen the show, but it's an NBC product. Um, we thought about the process of a dream come true moment and matching up dream makers, in this case it was retail stores who are buyers and can say, I love a collection of a designer, and the dreamers, which is a fashion designer. That was our process. That was what we thought made a lot of sense from an entertainment standpoint. And then we t switched our hats, and then we started thinking about who would that be a good solution for. So on the content side, that's kind of how um, we think, and I think maybe a lot of these people think, but you gotta remember, these are your clients now. And so this is how you have to think once you get that creative in mind. And it's not gonna be for everybody. You might be able to retrofit something in there, but Think about the process from creative first and then who might be a good solution uh, standpoint. And you become a salesperson. And you really gotta do your research. You know, is UEG the great place to go? I, I don't know if you've got a, a show about water and they don't have any water clients. But think creative first from my standpoint because I think I'm probably more on the content creation side now than I am the agency side. But so you guys created <clears throat> fashion, fashion star? Or how? Get, so yeah, you know, um, so I worked uh, for ad agencies, ad agencies for about four or five years. Then um, worked for Fox Sports for a few years. Then was hired by IMG to oversee their fashion division and got really, really familiar with the fashion space. And there's a lot of interesting, um, I'll call them characters. Job functions really is probably better, but uh, characters um, from a TV standpoint. Whether it's a designer, a buyer, a PR person, a marketer, an event manager, all these different roles. And uh, to us, one of the most interesting was the dream come true moment of someone anointing you as a success by buying your collection. We thought that was a very, very interesting process. We 
thought it'd be fun to make. We thought it'd be fun to share. And then we tried to think of brands that would make sense. Did you make a sizzle piece, or how did you actually go from idea to getting a brand on board? Yeah, you know, sizzle pieces, uh, it's not something that we do. Um, I know it's very, very popular in this space, making a tape. Um, it's almost, in my opinion, um, making your sales presentation before you've met with the client to assess their needs. So to me, um, in my opinion, it's a waste of time, resources, and dollars. So I want to actually talk to somebody first. And then if they ask me for a tape after that, maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll decide that they're not my client. Um, so that's my process. Let me, because uh, I think sizzle pieces, all this kind of stuff seems like really important information for people that are making content and going to market. David, to sizzle or not to sizzle? <laughs> Always sizzle. Uh, I gotta say, sizzle if it's a story you don't get on the first bounce. I think what he said, fashion star, if you're a brand, whether you're a retailer or a designer, it's just, I got it, makes sense. I'm not sure if you had the network partner when you went to the brands, obviously, because that's the distribution mechanism that Justine was talking about, right. which she's fortunate enough to have. Um, she's the luckiest one. Not, not that you, she's worked for it, but let me tell you, she's sitting on the, the absolute true north for where we should be, is sure. like making yourself the, the channel. Like, why wouldn't you do that if you have the ability to do that? Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of things too is a lot of people now want to be on YouTube just to make money, whereas I started doing this because I had a love and passion for what I'm talking about, a love for editing and production. So for me, you know, doing this is something that I absolutely love, and the things that I talk about are things that I love. And people that are watching my videos, they can tell that this is something that I really love to do. So a lot of people who are trying to create content, you need to think that if this is you as a person doing it, you have to be honest and you have to be true to your audience. And when working with brands, it, I've had to turn down a lot of really big projects because I was like, Eve, I don't care how much money you're paying me. Okay, I do. But <laughs> if, even if it is a lot, but it's a project or a product that I don't believe in, it's, like, I cannot physically tell my audience to buy this or use this. Because so it, she's it, a brand. And it becomes a sort of a trust thing too. You know, they trust if I'm, you know, drinking a certain type of drink that this is what I really honestly love. Right. So, you know, a lot of brands will come to me or my management agency, The Collective, and be like, you know, is this something that Justine would do? And if I can come up with a creative way and an honest way to relay that to my audience, then I'm like, yeah, this is, this is perfect. Can you just, for my own uh, enjoyment, can you tell me some of the weirdest things brands have asked you to do? I just, <laughs> I just gotta know. Um, Let's not. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, I was going to say that that attitude is is really healthy for brands too, because there's nothing worse than an inauthentic integration. I mean, that can actually set you back mm -hmm. so far if you're clumsy and you're out of place and you're out of touch with the consumer. You know, if you have your brand and you have Justine in this case study and the consumer. You know, the special source, I hate that term, is the linkage between the three. And if it's not genuine and authentic, you don't really have anything. That's really, really true. Um, so, I, Justine, just wh how did you get here? Like, what is your, what is your background? Like, how did you become I, Justine? Um, well, it's, it's kind of strange. When I was 12, I made my first website, and I was like, wow, I really love technology. So I just kept, from then on, you know, I was just always involved in the internet. I had a daily random photo website in high school, and then I went to school for multimedia and editing, and in my first job out of college, I posted a video on MySpace when my, my boss was out of the office of me doing like a little Irish jig, and I posted it on MySpace, and all these people started watching, and I was like, this is weird. They're like, when are you posting your next video? So I just continually started posting more content, and then when I found YouTube, it became insane because of the amount of distribution. Um, I created this video back when the first iPhone came out, and it was I got a 300-page iPhone bill from all of the text messages that I sent, and somehow AT&T screwed up the billing procedure, so they itemized everything. So I had this huge bill. Um, within three hours of me putting this online, it, I was getting calls from CNN, all these crazy news outlets. I was on like every news station, and I was like, okay, there's something to this whole internet thing. And it was about like 2007, so I was like, this, this can go somewhere. <laughs> So I, I think David said it, and certainly that's another story of what is, is, I think the word of the year is authentic, you know, that as far as everything that we're doing, all the brands that we're interfacing with, it is stripping back the bullshit and getting to who is the true person 
The person you see here is not a fabricated by an agent person. She started this when she was in her, you know, a teenager because she cared about communicating to people. So I think that's why she has a following. So you gotta ask yourself as a content producer, you know, who are you? Like, what do you want out of this? Because anything's possible. We're showing you that here from just the backgrounds. The question is, you know, what do you want? And then start crafting some ideas of how to, how to get there. Um, Questions? I mean, do you guys? I just wanted to talk a little bit about, because I think Justine raises a good point, and you raising a good point about being authentic. There may be people in the room who are non-scripted producers versus scripted producers. And you know, we, we deal in both. And I think it's really interesting when you're approaching a brand, if you're feeling like, well, I'm, I'm a scripted producer, and that's such a hard sell for a brand, or I produce reality, therefore that's an automatic for a brand. You know, I think there's a lot of play for both, getting bigger and bigger. That 63% content spend proves it. Um, but I think being authentic whether it's scripted or non-scripted is really important. So I would say don't count yourselves out if you are scripted people, people of that kind of narrative. Um, and, and same goes to reality. I'm, I'm seeing a lot. I'm sure you guys are all as well. I think let's go through from David uh, all the way back. Do you take pitches from content producers that you don't know that you've met at a, a conference? Go. No. Oh, at a conference? Yes. But, but a cold call? As a business... Is your business built upon pitches from people that have projects they really de desperately care about? We, no, it's not. It's built on looking at it from the brand's point of view and going out there and searching it out. And if something comes to us, yes, we'll look at it. But we're much more outgoing in what we're trying to find than reactive to what's coming at us. So how do you know that these guys are out there? Is there? Do you guys use agents? Do you? How do you get out there and field all these amazing treatments that we know these people have? I think it's just the uh, it's the world that most of our employees live in. Yeah. Um, I think if you're not interested in the space and you're not mining the sites and spending time on YouTube and caring about what's the hottest, most interesting thing, probably shouldn't be in this business. Right. And I think it's people's passions to read the blogs and read the trades and know what's going on. So, okay. I don't think there's a structured way we go about it, certainly. I, I heard a really interesting insight for uh, content producers is he's out there looking for people that have a shingle or already doing something um, to solve a problem that he's, you know, in his business, he's he gets served a problem, he's got to find a solution. So he goes out there and finds people that have a passion for doing something. So if you don't have that for your projects, either a web presence or a blog or have a voice, it's going to be hard for David to find you. So I think generates in a little bit different situation because I think you've set up your business around content producers and pitching and management meets production. Yep. You want to address this? Yep. And, and sometimes we are our own internal creative studio. So, you know, think of us like a TV studio that has a deal with a network, but also can, can sell elsewhere. So we are both taking in pitches from, if it were the TV example, writers, in this example, content creators, and then coming up with our own ideas. But um, this actually relates back to something we were talking about earlier, to sizzle or not to sizzle. Um, in that process of us taking pitches from different people who have a very small shingle, uh, a bigger operation, they produce lots of content, it's helpful for us to see what you've done. Whether that's a sizzle for a specific project or a collection, a reel of where you've been, you know, if we're going to work together and take something out to our clients, some of which are, you know, we're pitching to people like David. So if we're going to believe in something and take it up the ladder, then we need to know that you can you can really do it and believe that's, in it. That's an amazing point. I think that's the toughest thing in a lot of this entertainment field is breaking in and how do you get yeah. that first thing done? And Justine tells a great organic story. But we got to know that there's an ability to execute. There's so many good ideas out there and so many creative people. And, and in every ad agency, there's people who could execute. The, the trick is getting people to buy it and, and knowing and the trust there. And Generate has a, an amazing reputation and, and name for themselves because they deliver. Yep. That's a little bit of a chicken and the egg as well. So, yeah. you know, uh, I had a buddy who was the head of an ad agency, and he did not do any. Um, sorry. Excuse me, sir. C can you go out, go out and take your call? Uh, yeah, that's okay. I mean, he's entitled to calls. It's not in the front row. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so sorry. So that's okay. So he didn't do any um, uh, cold pitches. He went in with his resume. 
Um, so they had a reel and said, this is our body of work, and so this is how we can execute. The challenge is, how do you get that first piece done? Sure. How do you get that done? And that's, sure. that's the strategy. Do you go and work for somebody who is doing it and already has that track record and you sort of learn and then you go out on your own? Um, that's really sort of the, the chicken and the egg challenge. Um, but you know, again, in my, in my mind, I'm, I'm sort of a sales guy. And so I think what we've been talking about here is first and foremost, my old boss used to say, people buy you, he used to call me Eddie. Eddie, people buy you first, then they buy your product. So whether it's authenticity or passion or a great idea that you really believe in, that's you first. And so all of you have ideas out there. I'd say start with that and then think about switching hats and then think about the buyers on the end and who will be that audience. Ricky Gervais said something that I thought was very profound. He said, I'm gonna do my thing and if only a million people on earth like my thing and I offend everybody else, I'm gonna be a very, very rich man. <laughs> and it's a big world out there, it's a big country. And so your audience might be 25 million American Idol style or it might be 50,000. You know, you'll figure that out and the economics will work however or they do. Or 300 but, million. Or 300 million, <laughs> yeah, excuse me. So, uh, you know, you, American Idol, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> So, um, 300 million. That's incredible. I yeah. mean, that is really an amazing number for an individual to get um, just by doing what she loves. What you, and you're, you're talking about actually American Idol and Ryan Seacrest. Ryan Seacrest Productions, we just did a project with them and Coke where we went and made this Rube Goldberg machine, me and another fellow YouTuber, and it was, it was amazing. We actually just launched it yesterday. So we worked with Ryan Seacrest and you know, he tweeted it out and, and also was helping with distribution. And so, why, did he seek you out? Um, their production company did, okay, yeah. So they, they mm -hmm. sought you out probably because they enjoyed you. And it was, I'm and, guessing, and but they, I mean, they wanted, the And the hard part, too, is a lot of people on YouTube are creating content, but it's very vulgar content. Sure. So it's stuff that you can't advertise against. So, I mean, I guess the good part about most of my content is, is super family friendly. You know, I never swear. I never have any alcohol products. So it's very family friendly. And, and my audience is mostly young girls. So for them, you know, they look, this is, I'm, I'm hopefully a good role model for them. You know, you don't have to, to do these things to be successful and, and to, to do what you love. Yeah, knowing your audience for brands is huge because that's what they're buying at the end of the day. They're, they're trying to reach, they're going through their marketing plan and be like, oh, I've got to sell this product to this demographic. How best to do that? What's an innovative way to do that? Oh, here's a person that delivers that audience in high numbers that's passionate. Guess what? She's going to have a check floating in her direction to solve a business problem. Yeah, I think, and we touched on this earlier, I think also acknowledging that for most big marketers, as powerful a medium as I just seen is, it's only a tiny piece of the puzzle. And whatever content you're creating has to fit with that whole message because as crazy as it seems, every touch point, and we, since you said Coca-Cola, every touch point for Coca-Cola probably ladders up to three words on a PowerPoint somewhere. Okay. Um, and it's filtered down through tens, hundreds, and thousands of executives and producers, and what Justine's doing over here has to match up with what Ryan Seacrest is doing over here and whomever is doing over there. That's a lot of what we do at Omelette is we, we consider ourselves like a uh, brand showrunner. So we'll come up with the umbrella platform uh, idea, and we partner with production companies, we partner with talents, and we package it all underneath that kind of strategic umbrella, and then go to market in all media. So. It, it is a really fascinating uh, time. I'm aware that we're running out of time, so I would love to get y'all, if you have questions, this is an amazing opportunity to talk to people and get some questions out here. I don't know where the microphone is. We can't see. There's the microphone. So please raise your hands if you have any questions, if you want to drill down a little bit deeper, if you have any, uh, otherwise we could just keep spitballing here. Hi there, thanks. I'm Dr. Leslie Kay, and I'm a psychologist. I'll be pitching several psychology-oriented reality shows. Pros and cons of my own channel. I mean, I think the ideal thing would be right to get on a network and have my own channel. Can you say something about that? Self-branding and those as options. As a network, like a network television, or yeah, I'll be pitching to Bravo, Oxygen, uh, Warner Brothers. 
et cetera, tomorrow? No, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, if there was, if there, I've been approached by many shows where they're like, oh, that's great, we can, we'll give you a show, but you can't do anything on YouTube. Well, that makes absolutely no sense at all. So I think, you know, having that portion of your show is, you know, the best idea ever because you can show behind the scenes content and build your audience there and always, you know, have them readily available to let them know, hey, there's a new show coming on Friday. So make sure you check it out. Here's some behind the scenes. That's a great idea. Hi, my name is Adam. Um, this is more directed to the people that uh, would ex accept non-solicited pitches and stuff. I have a company, Vanguard Media and Entertainment, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're interested in one of my concepts. Part of their business model is that they charge a retainer, which I just don't, you know, 12 grand a month is a lot of money, or, you know, to retain their services. I'm wondering more about your business model and how you get compensated in that, you know, in that Don't way. do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So, and someone's retained to do what? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I missed what, yeah, I missed yeah. what they're offering. Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, as, as someone who takes in pitches, um, we would form a mutually beneficial partnership that if we sold the property, we would then compensate per that agreement. So, you know, we're all kind of working on a wish and a prayer, and we both understand that a lot of work is going to go into that before either of us sees a dollar. So, um, and, and part of Generate Yes is affiliated with Alloy, so there's a different relationship, but we also are an independent studio as well. So we're just like you. So that's our model. Yeah, you, you should never have to pay. You're bringing a ton of value, hopefully, exactly. in your intellectual property. Like, they should be paying If anything, you. yeah. And I didn't even know that business existed. Yeah. I want to be in that business. <laughs> you guys all owe us 12000 a month. I, I, that's, no, not, not OK, dude. It's, yeah, it sounds like you're, they're a, a smaller version of a um, sponsorship marketing sales yeah. group. Um, Okay. I think that they're probably retained by the other side of it, the brands. You know, yeah. we're retained by brands to go find guys like you, to then charge you for us to connect you with people already paying us. Seems <laughs> it's a great business, but tough to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's maybe, it's maybe it's like a PR hook. Maybe it's you know in that world where PR agencies will go after individual content producers and charge them as a way to make their voice happen. And can I don't know. I wouldn't do it. Uh, yeah. uh, I got a short question. Uh, for the scripted series, ad placements versus uh, product placement, which would you prefer? Oof. From, from, from whose point of view? From what point of view? From the brands? Uh, from the brands, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's different for every people. I mean, I have my own personal beliefs on product integration. In some cases, it works extraordinarily well. In other cases, I think it's a waste of time. And it's, it's so hard to give a broad answer on that. Yeah, for example, we represent a very, very big marketer who does a lot of film integrations. And they have no interest in product placement. Their interest is the promotion around the film and the paid media and being able to tie to the product while it's in marketplace. What happens in the film is OK. Because they don't have an awareness issue for a lot of them. And so it's different. Also, people generally hate you know, overt integrations. It has to be done with such mastery that you have to always be thinking about your audience because as a, as a brand, you could do more damage doing a bad integration than, you know, than helping your cause to sell products. People just hate you, which is, which is not cool. <laughs> it's the so opposite of that's what not, you're That's achieve. not well, money well spent, and it happens yeah. all the time. I think it's a case, too, of letting either the RFP, what that marketer is asking you for, dictate the idea. If they're asking for something that's very overtly branded, then you probably want to do something non-scripted that's very edutainment. It's a how-to with the product. But if, if what they're asking for is entertainment, then I think you want to let the idea dictate just how light the product duration should be. So I, I mean, it's kind of a non-answer, but yeah, I mean, in your business, I'm sure you agree. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a full spectrum. So it really depends on... so. 
These professionals have a filter, a very rigid filter that's a mandate from their clientele, usually. And they're going to try and fit opportunities through that filter. The, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging question because there's such a broad spectrum. You need to create what you think you like and are passionate about first, and then try and find the audience for it. They might not be your audience. Right. So if they, have, they represent clients that are not interested in being in the film, then they're not your client then they're not your prospective client. You gotta find people who, if that's your idea, love having the product in the film. I think And there's brands that love that. Without contest it's really hard to give you a good answer to that. Um, but maybe if you got, want to take somebody aside after and mm -hmm. kind of follow up, because I want to be cognizant of other questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do the research to find out who does that. And right. there's blogs and prospecting, and you know, I used to sell media for the Celtics, so I would watch Bruins games and Patriots games and see who was advertising there and see if there was a fit. So you try and define your universe of who you're going to go approach versus just spraying. Find the brands that like what you think you're selling. And I, and I would say, if the brand's interchangeable in the piece that you're doing, it's probably not going to sell. It has to have a point of view. Right. Um, point. If it could be Fiji or Perrier or any other brand, then it's not a character, then there's probably very little value in it for the brand. It's an excellent point. Hi, um, EJ, can you talk a little bit more about Fashion Star? You started talking about it a little bit earlier, but just maybe some more detail about how that came to be. And I don't know if you went to the, if you went to the brands first or if you did it through um, the network, for, like just any, anything, just sure, a little bit more yeah. about it. Sure, um, yeah. I think that's a good example of um, most people, not all people, um, thinking that's a very good brand integration. Some people found it offensive, and that's okay. Um, but we came up with the idea first. Um, then we went to the brands, and then we went to the networks. My partner and I believe that to get this sold um, to a network, we had to have those pieces in place first. And we felt as if um, it made sense and it was an entertaining integration. There are ones that are cheesy, over the top, can be uh, a negative, damage your brand. Um, most people feel it's a solid integration and fun and entertaining. There are some that disagree with that, but if you get past whatever that tipping point is, 20% or 80%, whatever it is, then you have a winner. So we approached the brands first, got them philosophically bought into the concept. We had to make sure that everyone played fair in the sandbox, whether it was Saks, Macy's, and, and H&M. Um, and then we sold it to the network. Um, so that was our process in that particular case. And that's usually our process. So again, me wearing my creator hat or my, my content producer hat first, I like to try and create things that I like and I think there's an audience for. Sometimes I'm wrong, um, sometimes I'm right. Um, but I start with the creative process first, attach the pieces in place that are integral to the story, and then I go out and try and sell it and try and find somebody that likes I it. I think that's an extraordinary case study, that show. Because using that filter you just said at the end, if you took the brands out, it doesn't work. Without the brands, there's no show. So it's kind of like the pitch. Yeah. So, you know, like it is the format. The yeah, format point. is brand integration. Yeah. The, what are those buyers thinking? What is their process? How do they decide that's the show? Right. Um, so that's our process on that one. Uh, more questions? I can't see. There's a lady in the back that has not had a chance yet. Sorry, sir. It's very hard to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can't actually see any of you guys. Hi guys. This is, this is great. My name is Anne Marie. Uh, this is perhaps a simple question. What do you do to build the relationship with the brand so you can go in and even say, hey, we've got this great content. We'd love for you to take a look at it. What are the beginning steps to introduce yourself? as a content producer. Um, Thank you. I would say first and foremost, do your research. Um, try and get smart about their business. Um, these people hear pitches. They have to have a very strong, they can, they can in theory sit around all day hearing pitches. They can't do that, they don't have the time. Show that you care about Fiji or Coke or Mercedes-Benz first by doing the research to find out if it makes sense because that's an efficient use of your time as well. And then figure out if they're a fit for what you're trying to sell. And then make a phone call. 
uh, and if you believe that you've got something of value, that'll come across and you'll probably get in front of somebody and they'll probably give you 10, 15 minutes of their time. Um, but hopefully you've given them a reason that it makes sense for them because if you're just spraying, you're not gonna get someone's time. So do the research first. And I mean, a lot of these brands are on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and they are listening. So even one of my friends who has maybe 10 Twitter followers, he said something about he bought a Zippo lighter and it broke. So he tweeted about it, and he's like, oh my god, Z Zippo just tweeted me back. He's like, I only have 10 followers. And so for me, there, a lot of times, if there's something that I want to do, you know, I'll reach out on Twitter, I'll reach out on Facebook. For example, which is kind of crazy, I was obsessed with Law & Order, and I was like, man, I just watched like, five seasons and then I kept seeing the same casting director show up at the end credits. I was like, I wonder if he's on Twitter. So he was. So I started tweeting him. I was like, hey, I was just wondering if maybe I could be a dead body on Law & Order. <laughs> so I just was strategic about it. Every, you know, a couple of weeks I would send him a tweet just as a little reminder. And then he looked into it and he actually had seen some of my videos before. A week later, sent me a script. A week later, I flew to New York and I got to do your dead body. So, um, it's, Congratulations. thank you, I was very excited. So, I mean, you never know how powerful the internet is until you actually really use it and start reaching out and networking with people. That's good research. Exactly. You saw that name 10 times or yeah. however many episodes you saw. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the have to be cognizant of the brand cycles. Oh, yeah. So if things are happening in a number of days, weeks, or even months, for example, I've spent the last six months talking about 2013 for most of our brands. So if it's something that's happening later in this year, you might get lucky and it may be opportunistic and someone may have budget for it, but most of them are assigned. So I think you have to be mindful of the timelines with most brands and activating against content programs. It's probably a minimum of nine to 12 months. Yeah. Uh, I think that that is, that is the end of this uh, panel. Thank you very much, great audience. Thank the panelists. Good job. Uh, and that, my friends, is that. <laughs> Scene.